I want to uh, introduce uh, Gabe Diaz. He's going to be actually your host for the evening. Uh, Gabe uh, is the director of City of Hampton's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Department and LGBTQ liaison, where he is, uh, where he directs programs that promote awareness, inspire mutual respect, and increase education and opportunities for diversity, equity, and inclusion. His responsibilities include guiding, planning, and implementing broad-based community-wide programs addressing the city's racial and cultural concerns, promoting community appreciation, public awareness, and encouraging uh, civil engagement where citizens can learn and uh, grow together. He manages the city's diversity college for ex uh, external and internal groups where participants increase knowledge about the value of diversity, unity, and inclusion in contemporary workplaces and out in the community. Gabe is also the organizer and founder of One Love Community Org and possesses several years of demonstrated experience as a community organizer, mentor, and advisor. With a passion for music and cultural arts, Gabe is an award-winning composer and lead singer for the band uh, United Souls Band. So Gabe, please. Thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you, Alan. There's a lot of great things happening here at the History Museum that you listed, so please make yourself available for any and all of the events to include tonight's special event. So we do have individuals joining us Facebook Live, as well as individuals here in the room with us. So I'd like to say once again, welcome. Um, tonight here at the History Museum, we are hosting the documentary that you all have seen advertised entitled Resilience, Recovery, and Rebirth, Sustaining Hope, <clears throat> excuse me, in Trying Times. And this film is directed by Mr. Horace Scruggs, focusing on Fluvanna County, Virginia. This film explores the area's African-American history from slavery through the civil rights movement told by local historians, storytellers, residents, and activists. A central focus of the story is the Brimo Slave Chapel, built by enslaved labor at the direction of, at that time, General John H. Cock in 1835. Worship houses, in, case, in this case the chapel, played vital roles in the resilience of the enslaved people facing the horrors of chattel slavery. Cock, being concerned about the religious and moral state of the enslaved peoples, ordered the construction of this chapel to provide them a place of worship and education. His desires were to educate and eventually liberate his enslaved Africans back to the con I'm sorry, back to the African continent. He was also met with violent pushback doing this by the community members due to the illegality of teaching literacy to Africans at that time. In this time, following the Civil War, the chapel was moved and was eventually consecrated as Grace Episcopal Church. In 2021, Mr. Scruggs and his musical group, Odyssey of Soul, with the support of the Fluvanna Arts Council and the Fluvanna Chapel of the NAACP, created the film to honor and celebrate those who labored in the building and the maintenance of this historic place. So this is an amazing documentary that you all are going to be witnessing today. And I just want to give you a little bit of brief background from the filmmaker, and we have him here present with us today. So a little bit about Virginia, Central Virginia's own musician, educator, and documentary filmmaker, Mr. Horace Scruggs. Tonight he will lead the attendees online and in person through a screening of his 2021 film, uncovering the local history of his ancestors and the larger African-American community with his trademark mix of thoughtful inquiry, humor, deep knowledge of this subject matter. Resilience, recovery, and rebirth, sustaining hope in trying times, echoes the experience of hundreds of thousands of African Americans in their quest for freedom and equality with emotional commentary blended with musical performances by the filmmaker Mr. Scruggs and his Odyssey of Soul Band. A multi-instrumentalist, composer, producer, conductor, documentarian, and photographer, Scruggs has worked as a professional musician since the year 1995. His extensive education in music includes studies at Longwood University, the Shenandoah Conservatory, and Berklee College of Music in Boston. Scruggs' many learning and listening concerts has traced the evolution of soul, gospel music, and pre-Civil War and the Civil Rights eras. So without further ado, I have the esteemed pleasure, please would you welcome the filmmaker, director, and our special guest this evening, Mr. Horace Scruggs.
Well, thank you for that uh, warm welcome and um, introduction. Um, as stated, my name is Horace Scruggs. I'm a native of Fluvanna County. And just to put things in, in perspective, and that's what I want to do kind of as a, just a little bit of talk before we show the film, is kind of put uh, spaces in perspective. So Fluvanna County is um, about 20 minutes southwest, sorry, southeast of Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, so we as a community kind of live in the shadow of three presidents um, and our mansions or our plantations. And those three presidents would be um, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe. James Monroe owns Montpelier or owned Montpelier. Of course, uh, Thomas Jefferson's home was uh, Monticello. And then um, James Monroe um, was uh, Highland. Okay, and so just a little, a, a short distance from there is the county of Fluvanna County. And Fluvanna County is on the banks of the James River. So this, this wide river you have here turns into a little narrower one up where we live. And it con, um, there's a confluence of the James River and the Rivanna River. And Fluvanna comes from the name that was given the James River at this confluence of the Rivanna and um, the James in a little small town called Columbia, Virginia. Anybody ever heard of Columbia, Virginia? You would have if one vote would have gone the other way. Columbia and Richmond were voted for the capital of Virginia. And Columbia lost by one vote. <laughs> so um, any, by either way, you had been right on the James River. And so the small town of Columbia is this confluence, confluence of the Rivanna and the James. And actually at that point, the James was, wasn't called the James River anymore. It was actually called the Fluvanna River. And so Fluvanna got, gets its name from um, that term, uh, Fluvanna, and then of course now it's called the James River even into the, the Blue Ridge Mountains. Now I bring that point up because Fluvanna starts with a, a suffix or prefix of F-L-U, which is flu. We get the terms fluidity, we get the terms, the idea of just water. And so one of the things that we have to understand that water was a major part of the commerce in Virginia. If you wanted to build a plantation, where are you going to build it? You're going to build it on a river because that is the way that your goods and services and people, enslaved people, were transferred from one plantation to the next. And we know that Richmond was a large port and a large place for enslaved people where, where they were traded. And so many times people were transferred from the area of Richmond into the deeper um, parts of Virginia by this river. So that's why Fluvanna becomes important to a greater story. So what happened was, when coming up with this film, this film basically takes the idea of um, some of the major happenings in America. And we talk a little bit about that, but then we bring it down to how it affected Fluvanna County residents. So we'll talk about slavery as a greater story, and then we'll talk about it as it took place in Fluvanna County. We'll talk about um, the Civil Rights Movement, how it happened as a greater whole in, in America, but then how it, how it was played out in Fluvanna County. So we kind of hit different places, different chapters, if you will, through the film. My connection, my family's connection, is through this um, man on the second line there, General John Hotwell Cock. John Hotwell Cock owned a, um, a plantation called Bremo. And Bremo was actually made up of three plantations or three large houses. My ancestors were enslaved on Bremo Plantation, on both sides, both my mother's side and my father's side. 
And, and one thing that I think we lose sometimes is um, how connected people were in these, on these plantations. That's why when I think about it, it was on my mother's and my father's side, because in this small area of Fluvanna County, there were several plantations, and there was lots of borrowing and trading between plantations. And in these plant and this enslaved communities, obviously there were also families created and relations relations created, and that's how it happens to be on my in my family that on both sides of my families we're connected to um, Brimo Plantation, and so this story starts with this. Um, it's called a Brimo Slave Chapel. You'll see a picture of it here in a middle minute, and we are the performances that we're having. We are actually performing in the slave chapel that really that still stands today, and it was very moving for me to actually be in that space where I am very confident that my ancestors would have also worshipped and would have also sung, um, and and their lives were molded by um, slavery and being enslaved um, in this space. So I hope you enjoy the. Um, presentation. It runs about an hour, and then afterwards we'll take time to have some questions. So again, thank you for coming, and thank you all for having me. Fluvanna is a land of rivers. The prefix of fluvanna, the word flu, is the same root word that we get the word fluid 
and fluency. With the mighty James at its southern border and then carved down the middle by the Rivanna and the hardware, this land was ripe for plantations. For plantations used rivers to move its cargo from the interior down to Richmond and out to its eastern ports. In this documentary, we will discuss the African American story, for slavery was no different in Blue Valley than it was in other parts of the South. And we'll hear some of the music that allowed the African American people to be resilient through years of turmoil and strife. In 1619, 20-odd Africans were brought to the Old Fort, Old Fort Comfort in what is now Hampton, Virginia. They were captured from West Africa and endured the Middle Passage to come and work in the, what is now the United States, what was then the British colonies. Um, the status of these Africans was complicated, and the status of Africans in Virginia was complicated for the first 50 or so years of the colony's existence. Um, Race-based slavery hadn't been codified yet, and there was a combination of people who were enslaved for life to people who could buy and earn their freedom. Um, however, in the 1660s, their laws began to pass in Virginia that codified this connection between race and enslavement. John Hartwell Cock Jr. was born in Surrey, Virginia, but his family owned and built um, a plantation on the banks of the James on what was Monacan land and is now Fluvanna County. Um, and enslaved people that they owned built three, three houses over about 80 years um, called Upper Brimo, Lower Brimo, and Recess. He was a member of the society that sought to emancipate enslaved people and relocate them to Liberia in Africa, and yet he never emancipated all of his own slaves. In the 1850 census, he owned 61 enslaved people in Fluvanna County and another 81 in Alabama. The plantation, as I said, was where my great-great-great-grandfather uh, was a slave, and uh, he uh, would move there from. He was moved there from another plantation in uh, in the state. But uh, he uh, was born in 1779 and died in 1883, 1833. I'm sorry, uh, but he was a uh, a senior carpenter on the plantation. There is a slave cemetery at Bremo that I, uh, after I found out I had uh, ancestors there, um, when I visited, I had the opportunity to go to the cemetery and it's still uh, in fair shape. Um, and my great-great-grandfather had uh, a uh, tombstone there that's uh, in the cemetery, and he has the most prominent uh, uh, st uh, headstone there. And I think that's due to the fact that uh, his son, Anthony, was a stonemason too. So it follows that uh, Anthony uh, would have uh, uh, been capable of putting that, that stone there and engraving it too. Um, so his name is on there and uh, so that's a, a, something that I'm very proud of. Cock taught his enslaved population to read and write, which was actually against the law in Virginia at the time. And as a result, he and his wife, who was their teacher, were subjected to violence. He also built the Bremo Slave Chapel, a place for the enslaved people at Bremo Plantation to worship. Um, during the American Revolution, both enslaved and free 
Africans and African Americans fought on the sides of the colonists and the British, hoping to earn their freedom um, for their service. Uh, as we know, in the United States, what is now the United States, that did not happen. Um, and many of the framers, or our founding fathers, owned people, owned slaves, and worked to protect their property and protect their right to own enslaved people um, in founding documents in the Constitution. Slavery would continue in the United States for about 80 to 90 years after the United States was founded.
and the white Americans would be down on the floor. Many times, in a lot of these communities, the African Americans outnumbered the whites. And so up in this balcony, you would have a crowded balcony. And possibly down on the floor, you would have plenty of room. And I can just imagine that song coming out from the heart of an enslaved person as they sat here crowded in a hot summer and looking down on the floor and seeing all of those empty seats. And that song would come out and that says, plenty good room in my father's kingdom. Pastor James Barrett. He, he was, was born, born in Louise in slavery. And when out of slavery, I don't know how he acquired a lot of property. So he had some property over here in Fluvannic County. He moved to Fluvannic County and he was a shoemaker. We had a church in the bushes, you know, after African Americans came out of slavery, they would put up, they call it bush harbors, where they would go in the bushes and serve the Lord. So he gave us the property where Thessalonians is today. So Lyle's church is also known as the mother of churches locally. Because there was already an established hierarchy within Lyle's that included African American deacons who served the black population of the church. It was a simple thing for them to help plant black churches in the community. The first being Bird Grove. Bird Grove Church turned out to be a little too far away for some of the black population around Wilmington to travel for services. So a few years after Bird Grove was established, a church called Evergreen was established much closer to Lyle's church um, with, with the help, the help of Lyles, Lyles again. again. However, African Americans continued to worship alongside their white brothers and sisters at Lyles Church up through the 1940s. In fact, John Hardwell Cox taught his slaves to read and he was greatly criticized. So, a lot of the slave, uh, enslaved came out of slavery knowing how to read. Now, they acquired, each community acquired land, and sometimes, you know, money, maybe they paid 10 cents, 50 cents an acre, a dollar an acre, and they built their church. The cab, there were little cabins and uh, whatever it could have been in uh, a shed on somebody's farm, and, they, and this is where they worshiped. If spirituals were made for the hard labors of slavery, then the early gospel was made for a newfound faith and a newfound purpose, and it was expressed in exuberance and joy and rhythmic vitality.
Churches in the communities were very important. On the fifth Sunday, we started a Sunday school union and 10 churches would get together on the fifth Sunday, and there were four fifth Sundays in a year. At that time, we met for the whole day. We sung spirituals, we recited, we didn't read from the Bible, we memorized Bible verses. Little ones would get up in front of that congregation and sing or recite a poem or recite a Bible verse. And I would say back then, those, those days, once I started getting involved in, in church, it, was, um, it just changed me because the people that were in there and just the things that we did, I mean, whether it was Sunday school and, and we had to stand up and recite, you know, Bible verses and, and it was like a comp and I was competitive. So Sunday school was competitive because it was all the churches in the county and, and you know, you're, you're trying to, you know, it, it's not that you, you, you got a trophy or anything at the end, but it was one of those where you wanted to, you, you know, you wanted to show out and, and in front of the other churches. And that was, uh, that was a big thing, and just church service. It was just, it was very fulfilling even at a young age. At the end of the Civil War, an era called Reconstruction started. Reconstruction is not a very well-known or talked about or understood time in the history of the United States. 
because it was short-lived and the lost cause narrative that the South perpetuated after uh, the end of the Civil War made Reconstruction seem like a bad thing. Black codes throughout the South limited what African Americans could do in every way, where they could eat, where they could shop, where they went to school, what they could do, where they could be at what time, where they could work, how much money they could make. Breaking of any of these laws, which started as informal but were later codified, could result in bodily harm, imprisonment, or death. Lynching was a very real danger for both men, women, and children throughout the South. And it was a way to keep black people in Southern communities living in terror. As an African American during the Jim Crow era, it must have been a daunting task to visit the courthouse in Palmyra. For even though the courthouse sat upon its hill, representing equal justice under the law, there were two other symbols that may have suggested otherwise. As you came up the hill, to your right was the old stone jail. And standing directly between you and the courthouse, was a newly erected Civil War Memorial. In the center of the Palmyra Court Square is a Confederate memorial. Late in the 1800s, a chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy was formed, and their first project was to clean up and fence a local Confederate cemetery. They had to raise money to do that, and they were successful at that project, which gave them confidence to tackle their next more daunting agenda item, which was to build a Confederate memorial for the uh, Confederate soldiers who had come from Fluvanna County. It was later suggested that the Confederate memorial be moved to the lawn of the courthouse. With this suggestion, the ladies of the UDC objected greatly. But this set in motion the writing of a law that is still in contention today. That they were fighting a losing battle. One of the members had a husband. He was a noted jurist, a past president of the Virginia Bar Association, and a past member of the Virginia General Assembly. He hastily put together a bill that he sent to Richmond. The General Assembly was in session. It was read into the record that very day and voted upon the next day and passed, meaning it became Virginia state law. And that bill that he sent said essentially that no Confederate memorial that was built on public land could be added to, detracted from, or moved once it had been established. This law was later amended by the General Assembly to include all war memorials. In recent years, there's been an ongoing discussion about the removal of Confederate memorials across the Commonwealth and across the South. And last year, the Virginia General Assembly overturned the law that originated here in the village of Palmyra saying that Confederate memorials could not be touched. Um, I remember my father talking to me uh, late in life, in his life, um, about a lynching in uh, Cluvanna. Our one documented lynching occurred in early October 1892. Two groups of young men had gathered to gamble in the woods outside of Kid's store. One group was black and the other group was white. And a dispute arose. Someone was accused of cheating and the session split up. The two groups went their separate ways. These people were uh, gambling. Up there were Kid's stories. And uh, there was an argument, and then there was a, a fight, 
and uh, there were black guys and white guys involved in it. And somehow uh, the one of the black guys got locked up and was put in jail in Palmyra. According to newspaper articles of the day, as the white group of kids was walking home, Phil Young leapt out of the woods with a loaded shotgun and shot 17-year-old Walter Glass in the head, killing him instantly. The same newspaper articles assert that Phil Young was arrested the next day at a dance. Was put in jail in Palmyra. And that night, apparently, there was a break-in in the jail and they took him out and lynched him. According to the coroner's inquest report, on the night before his first scheduled court appearance, William Young was abducted from the Old Stone Jail, walked through the village of Palmyra, taken across the Rybana River using the old covered bridge to the site of a slave cemetery for Solitude Plantation and lynched. When the coroner's inquest was held the next day, his body was still hanging from the tree. It would have been across this bridge whose buttresses still stand today as witnesses to this murderous act. And it would have been in this field that William Young would have met his end at the hands of a murderous mob. I say that the coroner's inquest report is the only uh, official document that we have because none of the participants in the lynching were ever identified or held to account for the murder of William Young.
School segregation existed throughout the South um, from the end of Reconstruction through 1969 in Virginia. Communities had to deal with educating their students, educating black students um, themselves. A lot of counties didn't necessarily put money towards the education of African American students. Many communities throughout the South benefited from the work of Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald schools. Uh, Julius Rosenwald established a fund with his family to pay for thousands of schools to be built throughout the South, several of which were also built in Fluvanna. The schools were built between 1917 and 1948, and they were responsible for educating thousands and thousands of, of black children throughout the South. And I went to Dunbar Elementary School, and uh, I, uh, uh, it was a two-room school, and uh, we had uh, a limited number of teachers. We had, uh, as I recall, my uh, principal. Um, my first principal was uh, Mr. Jackson, and he was there with his wife uh, teaching us. And uh, I went to, uh, started uh, with the first grade and went uh, to the, uh, the, the seventh grade. Dunbar was a place where we had a lot of freedom. We went outside and played. Teachers didn't come outside. When they wanted us to come in, they'd ring the bell, and we would go inside. There were two and three grades in one room. Everything was on the chalkboard. We learned penmanship. We learned you know, not only print, we could write, do script. There were a lot of activities. So, uh, but uh, I recall that we had uh, the had the pumps outside where you had to pump the water for the school, and uh, we had um, the. Uh, the uh, outside, the outhouses outside, the restrooms outside, and uh, we had uh, uh, to bring in wood for the heat, the stoves, and, and what have you. And uh, you had to bring your your lunch, and uh, if you had any. <laughs> My father drove the school bus. I can remember when my father came into the house and said to my mother, I need to borrow $1,500 from the bank because I want to be a school bus driver. But during that time, the bus drivers had to buy the chassis and the school system put the body on it. And I'll tell you some interesting things on how he used the school bus because part of it belonged to him. By 1958, it was obvious that the existing schoolhouses for Fluvianus black children, including the Rosenwald schools, were no longer sufficient. The school buildings were overcrowded and some of them were getting quite run down. With the threat of integration looming, the Fluvianna County School Board decided it was time to address the possibility of a consolidated grade school for the county's black school children. We had to ride the bus uh, to get to school. I had, I lived uh, about uh, a mile from the bus stop, so I had to walk a mile to the bus, get on the bus, and uh, go around through Fork Union from Shores and uh, to get to the, to the high school. And uh, in that trip, we uh, passed through the, by the academy and on by the White High School at that time uh, to get to um, Abrams. Um, but at Abrams, 
uh, we had uh, teachers that uh, were uh, more prepared than uh, in the elementary schools, and that's because of the natural progression of uh, what was available. And uh, we had uh, you know, more subjects of uh, the, uh, that uh, we were, that prepared us for the schooling. When I graduated, it was 19 of us. Why did we lose so many students? A lot of them was not, did not have the right skills. Some of them may have had learning disability. Some of them were probably parents were not able to give them the things that they needed, books, clothes. Some of them may have had to walk out of the woods long distances to try to catch the bus. Some of them had to work on the farms, and that kept them out of school.
decided to, you know, do a march and we wanted to speak to leaders of different, um, in different areas in our county and give them an opportunity to speak on what they are doing to kind of battle the inequities in, in, in their own um, departments and things like that before, because most people, they want to come out charging and blaming and pointing the finger. And I said, you know, we, we talked about it and said, well, let's not do that. Let's give them an opportunity to say what they're doing. And then, you know, that was the, the main reason of the march. And we wanted to invite, you know, people to join. So I, I know some members from Black Lives Matter, from Charlottesville and some surrounding areas, they, they wanted to join. And we, we explained to them exactly, you know, what we were trying to accomplish and, and why we were doing this. And, and, it, and it turned out to be uh, very productive and, 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 and what exactly what we wanted it to be. I think the thing is that not a lot of people know that those things are historical fact, and that's the problem. Like, not a lot of people have been educated on American slavery and slavery, especially in what's now the United States. There are a lot of misconceptions about slavery, and it's really hurting our understanding of where our country is right now. So we don't understand how we got here. And to talk about the stories that they heard from their grandparents and the things that they had seen as their parents, their grandparents were mistreated. And there were tears. People cried. And they would say, I, I, I don't want to think about it. It's almost like I passed through this era and I, I made it. And I, I don't want to go back because it opens up too many wounds. I'm not from Fluvanna, but my husband and I chose to move here and to raise our daughters in this community. One of the things that we liked about it was that everybody seemed to get along. People are friendly, outgoing, and often work together to accomplish great things. That kind of collaborative spirit really needs to rise to the fore now. We need to work together to fully understand our community's history and the roles that different people played in making Fluvanna the place that it is today. Until we can be honest about what happened before and have deep and meaningful conversations about it, it's gonna be hard to move forward. So looking back is a really important part of moving forward. I would say it, the biggest thing right now is, uh, and it may sound simple, um, but we, we always talk about change and, and how, you know, we can get things better. Um, how, how, how do, what do we do to create change? And I, and I always say when people start caring about the other person, um, then we can start, you know, affecting change. And I would say here in the county, I, I think that's the case too, because a lot of things have probably been swept, swept under the rug over the years. Um, and, and I think now eyes are open more and, you know, the collab more collaboration um, between the races and, and, and having conversations and, and, you know, caring about other people. I think that's, that's kind of the movement. That's what I'm looking at. I think that was a, that's what needs to take place right now is that, you know, um, in order for change to happen, we, we have to have these conversations and a lot of people stay away from them because they're uncomfortable and, and that type of thing. But the only, the only way we're gonna move forward is by having these conversations and, and, and also um, not being in denial of, of, of our own, um, you know, the transgressions or anything that, 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 that we've gone through and, and things that we're at fault for, we have to be honest with, with ourselves and, 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 and right our wrongs and, and, and move forward. And I think once people are able to do that, then, then change, change can happen. But until then, you know, um, we're, we're kind of like stuck in the mud. But, but I, I do feel that we're trying to move in the right direction, but, but we have to be honest. We have to have these conversations in order for us to move forward. And, and this is the, you know, I think that's where, where we need to be headed here, not just Fluvanna, well, we'll speak on just Fluvanna County, but in Fluvanna County, that's, 
that's the way that we can move forward. It's a little bit easier to listen to it now, because it's almost like you say, we have arrived. Look at how much progress we have made in this time. Look at all the things that, that our ancestors went through, but look at us now.
right, we're going to change format just a little bit and uh, ask Horace and, and Gabe to come up to the stage. And uh, I will circulate with the microphone. So if you have questions, put your hand up and I'll bring the mic to you. We'll ask those questions to Horace. So somebody get us started. What do you think was the most important thing you learned from making this movie? Um, there are lots of stories in there that I didn't know, you know, when I started um, digging in and diving in. I think the lynching was probably the most, um, you know, thing that changed me the most. Um, and, and the reason I say that, and I take this from someone else, so this bridge that that's crossed the Rivanna River in Fluvanna County, it's, it's just outside of our county seat. And so Route 15 runs right past. Route 15 would have been on that bridge, you know, back at that time. And someone said every time they drive past that bridge now, they can't help but think about what happened there, the lynching that happened. And I think that's one of the things that, um, that kind of permeates my life in Fluvanna now is that every time I drive past a certain church or a certain building or in ruins of an old um, mill or bridge, I begin to think of the people that lived um, during that time, both um, African Americans as well as um, white Americans, who kind of shaped our county. And, and we can take that at the nation, a national level, that all these little places that we pass how many of you were born and raised in Hampton? Not that many? Oh, yeah, two. Wow, that was like Fluvanna County. <laughs> we have a lot of people that moved, but moved to Fluvanna County. But in the same sense, you know, you drive past these little places and you go, wow, that happened there. And I'll finish by saying this little, this little story. There's a building in our town. It has two doors on the front of the building. You know, there's this little white office building. And I come to find out that that little building, one door was for African Americans, one door for, was for white Americans. And it was a dentist office. It actually was a, a physician's office. And my mom talks about going to there. And she said it was so funny because, you know, they had two waiting rooms. But if the white waiting room got crowded, well, guess where the white folks would come and sit? Over on the black side. But there's this, those are little monuments, if you will, in our county and in our spaces that we live that are just, that harken back to the, the times that we've, we've forgotten. So I would say just to kind of look for those, for me, it's just like looking for these little spots in our county that, that remind us of things gone past. Thank you. Also, just in reflection to your comment, I think it's notable that <clears throat> the historian said that that was the one and only recorded lynching in Fluvanna. Yeah, very true. Right. Yep. And there has been, um, everybody knows of the Equal Justice um, Project, um, and the, it's basically a lynching museum in Mississippi, I believe it is, if I can correct me, um, and some of the, the dirt some of the soil from that site is in that museum in Mississippi. Yes. I'm just a little unclear as to where Fluvana actually is located. What, what direction or? Sure, um, Fluvana County, if you would go up 64, straight west, um, I think it's about 140 miles. <laughs> Take 64 straight west, um, just this side of Charlottesville, Virginia, okay. to the south is Fluvanna County. It's okay. almost in the center of the state. It's a very little square. Um, Fluvanna County came out of Albemarle County, which came out of Goochland County. Okay. What's the population there now? I think Fluvanna runs about 27,000. Oh. It has a it has a, um, a gated community, so it's very populated on its northwest corner. Um, but then the rest of the county is pretty much like what I remember as a kid. Okay. Thank you. 
And I'd like to mention my, my cousin, my first cousin, and her daughter are here. They live up in uh, Newport News. Um, and so that's, we're the same generation, but when we talk about the ancestors that were enslaved in Brimo, we're also talking about their, their ancestors as well. Oh, we've got a question right behind you. Um, no, uh, well, I shouldn't say no. The, the lady in the middle is my sister, Gail, one of my sisters, um, Gail. And then there's a husband and wife in the group, um, E.C. and Nadia. And then the bass player and the drummer are um, son and father and son. So, yeah. I have a question. I'll <laughs> hand the microphone to me. Uh, I, I noticed in... And maybe I missed a little bit of something there, but uh, with about the lynching, it said the lynching was uh, was it done at the uh, African American uh, cemetery or taken to? Because I noticed that uh, the film showed the empty field was where the lynching took place, and I was wondering if the cemetery had been moved. Right. So um, as it, as it's, I'm sure is here as well, um, <laughs> at some point all the land was probably part of somebody's plantation. Um, and so where the lynching takes place was on a plantation called Solitude. And it's basically on the banks of the Rivanna River. Um, and so, as mentioned in the film, when you walk into the, the small town of Palmyra, you look straight ahead and there's the, the courthouse. And then over here, there's the, the, um, the stone jail. And then right in the middle is the uh, monument, um, Confederate monument. Just down the hill, across the river, was that old stone, sorry, that old um, covered bridge. And so they would have taken him out of the town of Palmyra. You know, it's uh, legislative jurisdiction. You know, you wouldn't want to murder somebody in the town seat, right? So you would take him out of that town. And then there was, um, or there was an old plantation and an old cemetery of, for enslaved people. Um, he was lynched there. What year was that? Oh, not sure if she missed that. I think it was, um, it was like the 30s, I think. Maybe the 20s. Or the lynching. The lynching. Are you asking the, uh, the year of the lynching? When, when was the lynching, yes. Did anybody catch that? And second follow-up question, was that like a, a deep, dark Palmyra secret that you had to drag out, or was that common knowledge around town? Was that um, remembered? Joe Creasy, um, who uh, speaks as a retired um, um, Army, uh, he said when he was told about it, his father would always whisper. Even if there was nobody else in the house, he would always whisper. So I think it was something that was known in the community, but um, if you were old enough and if you know, somebody told you about it, I had never heard about it until, until digging up this film. Um, which brings this idea that um, my mom talks about this as a, as a person of color, as growing up in a small southern town. Children weren't told a lot. You know, if something went on in the community, you, you just didn't talk about it. You didn't tell your children that somebody was killed or somebody was, you know, um, whatever thing that, or rather illegal things that were going on. And she said because then a child has um, reasonable, when they say they don't know, well, they don't know. And so a lot of our history, a lot of African American history is lost because of that. Because um, there's a generation, kind of the generation above me, they're just trying to forget all of that. You know, um, the commentary, comment, um, Moselle at the end, she says that a lot of people have, have lived through that and they just want to forget it. And so a lot of it was not told to my generation. But now it's my generation and my children that are really interested in those stories. And we're trying to drag it out. My mom is, um, is 93 years old. And every once in a while, if you catch her with the right question, she'll begin to talk. 
But otherwise, you're not hearing much out of her. We just recently, and Leslie, <laughs> we just recently rediscovered um, a cemetery that was very close to where um, our family grew up that has, um, it would be our third grandfather, Wash Mills. He's buried there. And we, haven't know, we have known about that all our lives. But finally, my mom said something this summer about a cemetery kind of near where we grew up, and we did some bushwhacking through the woods, and, and there it was, you know? So a lot of these stories are kind of lost to time because people don't want to talk about those, those bad times. Right, it's far apart to fathom. Right. But and then, you know, if it's a small community and this has happened, how do the community bury its sick ones? I think um, a lot of times people and my mom put it this way as well. She said, you know, Flubana, people in Flubana County get along, blacks and whites get along, as long as everybody stays in our place. You know? Um, and I think when the chips are down, so to speak, then that's when those mobs and, those, and that kind of um, real racial hatred um, can, can show up. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. It's always, you know, it's always, <laughs> you know, it's always stewing under the bottom there, right? But we need something to, to make it ball over. I think we had a question over here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Um, the General John H. Cock, Cock. Mm -hmm. help me here, Little England Chapel, Mary Johnson, and her stories, there was a restaurant reference. Is that a connection, or do you have any historical connotation from him? Because there were properties here. Carolyn, help me here. <laughs> Pardon? Okay, so possibly related? Possibly. Okay. That's not the part. Brains. I don't know what you want to know about it. Well, I'm trying to figure out is there a connection between the property or the family here? Well, two, there were two families that lived on the entrance to the Hampton Creek, sort of across from HU, and uh, <coughs> they were very involved. They, they were, one was the Armstrong family, and right. it wasn't, this wasn't the general that gave the land, but it was his family right. that did. And uh, the other family was a northerner who had come down and just uh, bought a lot of property, but he set up a whole, well, he sold the land and had it divided uh, for a, a wonderful black neighborhood, which is really getting very modern right now, Ivy Home Road. But, but the chapel itself the cock was- what I'm trying to say. That was his name, right? Cock. Yes. Yeah, C-O-C-K. And I believe what you what you all are referencing. The ones that gave the land to the chapel, but it was in their name, but to build it there, and they educate, and it was uh, listed as educated right after the civil civil, civil war. Okay, but no, he. Uh, but we can check. We can check into it because actually you, you brought up a good point. Before the, uh, we did. We had we had a small dialogue about that as I was a privy to view the documentary before tonight. Um, there were some similarities, and I brought up Little England Chapel, and I had asked Mr. Scruggs if he was familiar with the story or the history there because they're very parallel, and a lot of this was very reminiscent of the 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 the, the evolution of Little England. 
So I'm on that assignment. I'm on that assignment to see. I have a comment. Okay. No, I was going to say, are you done? I'm sorry. Are you done? Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, I'm from a small town in Georgia, and this story resonates, you know, like many other small towns throughout the nation, and you also spoke on that. Um, and you may have said it, but how far are you away from? Um, Monticello. So um, Monticello is, I mean, where I live now, Monticello is about 20 miles away. So interesting, and that's interesting that you bring that up, because Koch and um, Jefferson were contemporaries. If you look, if you go to, if you were able to go to Bremo Plantation that Koch built, it's like a small Monticello. How many of you have been to Monticello? Wow, good number of you. So you notice that the main house is above ground, and all the service quarters are below ground. Well, it's the same thing at Bremo. When you come up to the front of Bremo, you're looking at this um, rotunda, pillars, big columns on the front, and it looks like it's just sitting there by itself. And then behind it, you have the James River you know, Valley floodplain. Um, you walk around behind, and there are two wings, and that's where all the um, uh, enslaved people would have been working on below ground and then shuttling food and whatever services that they were providing for the, for the house um, behind the scenes. Yes? Is it open to the public, the tours? No, Brimo is still, and we had this discussion before, um, interesting enough, I recently got to go into Upper Bremo, which is the big house, you know, that's the term we use, that um, Cox designed. So John Hotwell Cox's descendants still own Bremo Plantation. Um, and just two weeks ago, I got to go into the building with my daughter. We were invited. And um, a man by the name of Sam Johnston, which I think would be like six generations from Cock or so, still owns it, and I got to sit across the table from him, um, from the you know a, a descendant of the person who owned my um, ancestors. Um, it was very moving. It was very kind of um, you know when you walk into a space like that and you're very cognizant of what happened in that space and what could have happened in that space. It's very heavy. Um, but the wife of Sam Johnston is from California. <laughs> so she's very open to um, trying to get past that history. Yeah. But I don't think it, um, right now, it is not open to the public for tours. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question I wanted to ask. I know you were speaking about um, keeping the history and reciting history and that's how stories are created that's how stories are told and and carried on with regard to family history and ancestry and lineage I'm curious to know if there's a percentage that you could come up with with how much of this documentary history was actually documented for you to take a look at and how much was just stories being told um I'm thinking of the people speaking. So my daughter, daughter, <laughs> which is uh, Hannah Scruggs, who speaks at the beginning. So she did some research. She's a genealogist um, historian. So that would have been, you know, on paper document. And then um, Trish Johnson, the our historian for our historical society. Those kinds of. So out of that, you know, what percentage is that? Maybe thirty percent of what we're talking about. The rest of the people are talking from just stories that they've heard from their parents or 
they have experienced themselves. So I, I think you bring up a very good point, which is um, this idea that this information is being passed from one generation to the next. And we talk a lot about in our historical society, which I'm a part of the board on our historical society, is that, you know, we're losing a generation, you know, every few years you lose. You know, like I said, my mom's 93 years old. You know, within eight to ten years, those stories would have been gone. And, and we know that the stories are lost long before they, they pass away as well. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of grasp some of these stories and write them down and document them. Absolutely. Have you done a family? I think he's going to get... He's going to get the mic so the other people Yeah, because we do have, I'm sorry, and for those of you who are just joining us, once the presentation has already started, we do have an audience live on Facebook, so that's why we're asking for the microphones so they can hear us as well. And I'm not sure if we're tracking for the comments on Facebook, but if you do have comments, please submit them. Yes, ma'am. I just wondered, you've done so much research, but have you done your own genealogy of your family? Do you have a family tree where you can trace the descendants? Yeah, I have, um, I have a daughter who's a genealogist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, you said that, so you, you cheated. Uh, no, I, I, tell, I tell people that, you know, when it comes to genealogy, it's too much like math. I mean, there's just like all of these lines that go, you know, okay, you got your mother and father, and then it just turns into branch, branch. But, um, yes, my daughter has done extensive, and then I have a sister who's done a great deal of, of work in that. Did you um, find any surprises? Did you find that you might have been related to someone else in your town? I don't think so. Um, interesting for us, our last name Scruggs, we don't know, that, that is a maternal name in my family. Mm -hmm. That is not a, a grandfather's name. So we don't know who my grandfather's father is. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who my great grandfather is on my dad's side. So that's kind of the only dead end that we really have. Yeah. I have one last question. Sure. Bremo Plantation, what's the name Bremo? Where, where did that come from? There's some, I think that was an old English name. Okay. Um, and the town that is there now is called Bremo Bluff. Okay. Um, I think you can Google it. <laughs> it may show up. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the town is Bremo Bluff which was my mailing address growing up as a kid. And just to address the gentleman in the back with your question early when you were saying about such a small town, yet when you see the mob for the lynching, it seems like everyone was there. Um, and I can't speak for that particular lynching, but I've done much research on other accounts. And unfortunately, a town lynching was very much a celebratory event. So oftentimes individuals would come from the neighboring city, the neighboring towns to witness what was the spectacle to be had. So oftentimes you saw individuals that weren't always from that particular town or county, but they came from near and far and they created a day of engagement, if you will, to witness. Yeah. I have a, a few comments from uh, Facebook I'd like to uh, put to you, one from uh, Laniel Naylor, uh, uh, who comments, my Naylor, uh, enslaved African ancestors lived in Fluvanna County. Um, from uh, Jonathan uh, Beatum, uh, just a compliment. Great documentary, weaving history, music, culture, and message of how we all need to work together. Uh, from Audrey Cannon, my great grandmother Payne is also from Fluvanna County. She married a Carey. Uh, and she also says an outstanding documentary. And then from uh, Aaron, uh, I love to hear that. I lost our family genealogist years ago. Uh, didn't appreciate that no what knowledge he had until he was gone. I think that is a, an important. Once that connection is broken, uh, once that generational connection is broken, you can't reproduce it. Uh, we run into that in developing the stories we tell here at the History Museum all the time. It is absolutely critical that we preserve these stories. So thank you for that work. Any other questions? It is a little after eight, so if there are more questions, we can certainly entertain. Okay. I just want to make it clear, I wasn't really tuned in at first. The Little England Chapel 
was not built for slaves ever. It was built after the Civil War uh, and by two uh, northerners given the things, and it was for to be a school and a place to worship. But it was, they were all free. Thank you. All right, very good. If there are no more questions, then thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you uh, all thank for coming you, out. Thank you, Horace. Thank you, Gabe. What a wonderful presentation. Yeah. What a wonderful documentary. Uh, remember those things I mentioned uh, earlier? We have a chess activity here this Saturday, and next Wednesday night we have a concert. So uh, come back and join us again, and we'll be doing this kind of thing. Uh, before, we, before I let you go, uh, this is kind of a new thing for us, the screening of documentaries. We did one uh, last summer on the, uh, uh, the nurses, uh, of Dixie Hospital, and uh, I think that was well received. And we've had this. How how do folks feel about this kind of approach? You like this? We're, I think we're going to try to integrate more of uh, of documentary work, and hopefully get the filmmakers here as well uh, going forward. So, thank you very much, and come back and see us next time. Thank you. Thank you all.